Hello, in a previous video I went through a GRE analytical reasoning or verbal test and I have since taken that down uh, but one of the main ideas was that in order to get a good score on the verbal reasoning one needs to know quite a few words that most people do not use in, in English. In fact, even a lot of academic sources don't use a lot of the words found in the GRE uh, vocab, basically. It's a vocab test. Uh, compared to the quantitative reasoning, which is the level of an eighth grader, basically. Uh, it's absurdly easy. And so in this video, I'm going to go through uh, the quantitative reasoning practice exam that I have on the screen here and demonstrate that it, it really is just arithmetic and it's it's comically easy compared to what's a fairly challenging vocabulary test and then we can make our inferences as to uh, what so many grad schools are focused on and, and how that does or mostly does not make a whole lot of sense in our 21st century digital economic world. Uh, so, anyway, looking at numbers 1 through 9, two quantities, quantity A and quantity B, you are to compare the two quantities, may use additional information centered above the two quantities if additional information is given. Choose if quantity A is greater, quantity B is greater, the two quantities are equal, or the relationship cannot be determined with the information given. Number one, we've got some fractions. We've got to figure out a least common denominator, perform the uh, what would be about fifth grade math there. So we got 5 fourteenths, and that's plus 8 twenty-firsts. And so that's going to give us the least common denom denominator of 42. That equals 15 over 42 plus 16 over 42. And if we need a refresher, 14 times 3 is 42. 15 times 3 is 15. Sorry, 5 times 3 is 15. 21 times 2 is 42. 8 times 2 is 16. We'll add the numerators, and we get uh, 31 over 42. This is not exact, but it's, this is approximately 3 fourths or 75%. And then our other 26 over 35 and we are subtracting from that. 3 over 14, find our lowest common denominator. We end up getting 52 over 70, minus 15 over 70, 26 times 2, uh, 3 times 5, 70 on the bottom. So we'll perform the operation on the top. We get 37 over 70. And this is not exactly, but it is approximately 4 sevenths. Four sevenths is about 55%. And so in this case, three fourths is clearly greater than four sevenths, and thus quantity A is greater. Easy peasy. All right, moving on. N is an odd number and multiplied, and a multiple of five. N is an odd number and a multiple of five. And so we want to determine if the remainder when n is divided by 12 is greater, or if 6 is greater. Uh, so, let's just do a couple quick examples. It's a multiple of 5, so 5 over 12, n is divided by 12, and then we're going to compare that. Let's see, what's our remainder? Well, we don't have a remainder, it's less than 1, so that's it's already not looking good. Uh, let's get to the first multiple which is 15 divided by 12, so we get 1R3, right? Let's do a, just another test case, which is 25 divided by 12, and we get 2, remainder of 1. And so in both of these cases, the remainder is less than 6, but let's just continue on uh, just to make sure. About 35 divided by 12, well, now we get uh, 2 in our remainder is an 11, and so we've got 1, 3, 11, and it could basically go a lot of different ways. So D, the relationship cannot be determined given the information. D is the answer for that one. The absolute value of X equals the largest integer less than or equal to X. 
an absolute value of x. And so we've got negative 1.5 and then negative absolute value of 1.5. The absolute value of any negative x is going to equal uh, x. And the negative absolute value of any x is going to equal negative x. So the absolute value equals the largest integer less than or equal to x, which is greater, negative 1.5. So we're looking at 1.5 or negative 1.5. The largest integer less than or equal to 1.5 is negative 2. And then the largest integer less than or equal to negative 1.5. Uh, negative 1 will say 1.5, the largest integer less than or equal to 1.5 is 1. And so we get negative 1 for B, which means that B is larger than or greater than A. Uh, really simple, embarrassingly simple math. And just to think that the, the future engineers of the world uh, need to take this math test and that it would mean anything other than that they could enter into an undergraduate program of study uh, and not one <laughs> that's very, very challenging. Uh, that's really something. But let's just play the game here. We want to get our good GRE score uh, to show that we could graduate from high school passing Algebra 1. Uh, 2x plus y squared is greater than 6. We want to know if x or 4 is greater. Like so let's just move things around. We get 2x is greater than 6 minus y squared. And so then is x greater divided by 2 or is x minus 6 is greater than negative y squared. Uh, well, so we have a problem here. There's only one equation, and there are two variables. We've got y squared and 6. We don't know what we can't solve for x except in terms of y. So that one's going to be d. Right? We need another equation in order to solve for two variables. We can solve for x in terms of y, but we can't solve for the actual value of x uh, without simultaneous equations. So a couple little tricks, but nothing that should really throw anybody for a loop. Uh, some rational expressions here. you got just regular quantity a and quantity b, 2xy minus x minus 2x squared over 2x minus 4x, we're going to simplify. Uh, let's factor out an x on top, so we're going to get x times 2y minus 1 minus 2x. And then that's all over negative 2x, because 2 minus 4 is negative 2. And so then we can get rid of the x on the bottom and the top there, and we can also then get rid of the negative 2 and we're going to end up with negative y. Uh, change the signs, plus 1 half. Again, change the signs, plus x. And then we'll just flip these orders around. x minus y plus 1 half. All right, so which is greater, this whole rational expression, which is equal to x minus y plus 1 half, or x minus y? Well, that plus one half means that a is greater, because we here we have the same term, x minus y, and x minus y, but then in this one we have plus one half, and then quantity b does not have plus one half, so a is the correct answer there. Moving along, the area of the square with a perimeter of twenty and the area of a circle with a radius of three. Right, perimeter of 20, it is a square, so all of the sides are the same. 20 divided by 4 is 5. 
the area is 5 squared or 25. The area of a circle with radius 3, pi r squared is 3 squared pi or 9 pi. And so now we've got a pi term and an integer term. We want to compare these two without a calculator. So we're going to just estimate 3.14 and let's just make a really rough estimate of 3. 9 times 3 equals 27. 27 is greater than 25, so B is greater. All right, so a little bit of geometry here. B, C, we've got a center point O, A, B, C, X, Y. Uh, so if you go back and recall your first geometry class, then this angle X is half the measure of this angle Y. And so then, uh, let's see, these two are equal. And there's really no other way but to remember. You can kind of infer it, but if you didn't remember, so there is a little bit of math on here, but it really is on a high school level. Um, central angle Y again is twice that of the angle at the perimeter. Quantity 6, X, and 18, when we get, we have 2X plus 4 equals 9. All right, so we've got 2X, we're going to subtract 4, 2X equals 5, X equals 2.5, 6X equals 6 times 2.5, or 15. Uh, 18 is greater, B. Moving along here. Quantity A, two fifths of one percent. So we got one percent. Sorry, point one percent equals zero point zero zero one, and two fifths is equal to zero point four. So we want to multiply these two together. Zero point zero zero one times point four. We're just going to move the decimal over. Zero 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 four. Uh, and we can see that quantity B is clearly bigger. All right, maybe they'll get more difficult here. Questions 10 through 25 have different formats. Select single answer choice unless the directions say otherwise. For numeric entry, questions follow these instructions. Enter your answer in the box or boxes provided. Your answer must may be an integer, decimal fraction, or negative number. If the answer is a fraction, you will be given two boxes an upper one for numerator and a lower one for the denominator. Equivalent forms of the correct answers such as 1.6 and 1.60 are all correct. You do not need to reduce fractions to lowest terms. How many different diagonals can be drawn on a regular hexagon? So we kind of need to know what is a diagonal. Well, so we can do like that. That's simple enough. Diagonal is just connecting the vertices. How many is that? Well, and then we've also got these here, these here, and I think that's all of them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And coincidentally, n times n minus three over two is the formula in case it's like a dodecahedron and we don't want to count all of them. Uh, that's the formula for the number of diagonals. So 6 times n minus 3 is 3 divided by 2 is 18 over 2, or 9, so D is the correct answer. All right. An agency cleans carpet at the rate of 5 cents per square foot, how much will it cost to clean a rectangular rug with a length of 25 feet and a width of 12 feet? So again, 
just like a waste of time it's so easy that if I were a future engineer or anybody <laughs> imagine that a, ma a person going for their master's degree in math is doing this to get entrance to grad school as if it means anything I would find it absurd that I need to know like the definition of the word slake or something way too esoteric and then they they give me this one but uh, nonetheless there must be some reason other than a waste of time and cost us money or not uh, rectangular rug with a length so we're looking at area you want to clean this rug 25 times 12 well 25 times 10 is 250 and then 25 times 2 is 50 so this is equal to 300 square feet 5 cents per square foot 300 times 0 0.05, 300 times 5 is 1,500, move the decimal places a couple, couple spots over and we get 15 bucks. $15 and no cents. No cents, just like... Uh, which of the following equations described for this question indicate all the answer choices that apply? So. A little bit of trickery, there might be one right answer, there might be more than one. Which of the following equations describe a line with a slope less than that of 5y? So we need to figure out first of all what is the slope here. 5y minus 4x equals 3. Let's change it to y equals mx plus b. We get 5y equals 3 plus 4x divided by 5. We get y is equal to four-fifths x plus three-fifths. All right, so our slope is four-fifths. Slope less than that, so we want, so then we just have to go through all of these answers and decide which ones have a slope of less than four-fifths. So just a little bit of busy work. Four y equals negative five x plus 3 divided by 4, y equals negative 5 fourths, x plus 3 fourths looks like a, any negative number is less than 4 fifths, 4y equals 2x plus 3 divided by 4, y equals uh, 1 half, x plus fourths looks like b one half is less than four fifths c y equals five x plus three not c d y equals negative five x plus three like d is correct any negative number is less than four fifths and finally e uh, move get 5x minus 3 equals negative 4y, divide by 4, and we get, divide by negative 4, oh, not negative 4, sorry, I'm moving that to the other side, 5 fourths x minus 3 fourths, not e, so a, b, and d, a, b, and d there. Next, which of the following points are closer to 3, 9 than to the point 5, 3? Which of the following points are closer to, oh, than the point 5, 3 is. All right. So let's get ourselves a little bit of a graph here. Right, so we've got 3, 9. 3, 9 is way up here. 5, 3 is over here. And our difference being a uh, difference between 3 and 5. So you got uh, do rise over run. Difference between 3 and 9 is 6, 
negative six. Rise over run. Oh, no, that's not what we're doing, sorry. Alright, let's look at this is two to six, two squared plus six squared is equal to forty. So we're gonna call that C. C is equal to the square root of forty or two root ten. Uh, and we don't even need to do that. Let's look at that. 40. Next point is 1, 2, 3, 1. Well, I think we know that's closer, right? Nope. It's way up there. No, I'm not looking at that one. Uh, so we've got 0, 0 plus 8 squared equals 64. Not closer. 1, 5. One, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, difference here of two. Difference here of four. So two squared plus four squared is equal to 20. So check for B. Negative one, eight. Negative one was over here, and then eight is way up here. So we've got one, two, three, four. 4 squared and then 1 squared is 17. Check. So that gives us C. D, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 9 gives us 6 on the X. And then 3. Six again, that's way too many, that's 72. That's a no, that's a no. And finally, zero, six. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. That gives us three here, and two there. Nine and four is 13. All right, so we got B, C, and E are the correct answers there. Using the Pythagorean theorem, A little bit of geometry. What fraction is equal to 0.75? That's just ridiculous. That, that's embarrassing. 3 over 4. Okay. What is the perimeter of the below rectangular shape? And again, this is fairly embarrassing. What kind of math test is this for graduate students? I mean, if you're going into English or art or something, I guess. But just a, a just a regular general records exam? I don't think so. All right, let's um, the perimeter is going to be the same as if we just had a rectangle like that. So we're going to add these two up, and we get eight. So it's going to be twelve times two. And we can we can do this a couple different ways. Uh, 12 times 2 is 24, and 8 times 2 equals 16. 24 and 16 is 40. D is the answer. Or we can add 12 plus 3 plus 5 plus 2 plus 5 plus etc. I mean, we could split it up like that, and we get 5, and we get 2 again. That means that this is 2 and it's 10. But we can just swing this point around and make a rectangle. And then we get 12 on this side, 8 on that side. 12 plus 12 plus 8 plus 8, 40. Next page. Which of the following could be the set of lengths of a right triangle? All right, well, let's have a look at this here. 1 and square root of 2. 1, 1, root 2. Yes. 45, 45, right? Um, isosceles right triangle. 1, 1, 1, root 2. So A. Next, 3, 4, 5. Yes. 3, 4, 5 right triangle is another one. And we can check these out. 1 squared plus 1 squared equals 2 
square root of 2 equals square root of 2. 3 squared plus 4 squared equals 25. Square root of 25 equals 5. But we just uh, memorized these things growing up. Uh, next one, 4, 5, and 6 doesn't look like it. Does not look like it, no. 4, 5, and 6, 4 squared. The longest side has to be the hypotenuse. Plus 5 squared equals 16, and 25 is 41. 41 is not a perfect square, so no for C. 0.6, 0.8, point and 1. 0.6, point 0.8, and 1. This looks like a 3, 4, 5 to me. Uh, it's just a scale of 3, 4, 5. 0.6 squared is 0.36. And 0.8 squared is 0.64. 1 squared is 1, so that squared, that figures out. And then 3, 4, and root 7. 3, 4, and root 7. Ah, let's see, this is just a trick. Root 7 is not the longest. It's, uh, they've provided a distractor here with the root 7. So the square root of 9 is 3. The square root of 4 is 2. So root 7 is somewhere between 3 and 4. And so we've got 3 squared plus root 7 squared equals what? 9 plus 7, and that equals 16, which equals 4 squared, and so E. They've just put these out of order to distract us, and that's like where they just catch the people who are flying through this thing. Uh, number 17. Let m be an odd integer and even be an n be an even integer. Which of the following must be even? Well, any number times any number times an even number is even. So anything times m is even. Uh, all evens are multiples of two, and so c. An even number, plus or minus an even number, must be an even number, but we don't have that. An odd, plus or minus an even, must be odd. Uh, e is definitely odd. And so now we're left with B and D. Anything involving an odd, plus or minus an even, or an even, plus or minus an odd, must then be an odd number. So A, C, and E. Next, city A is 800 miles from city B. City B is 1,500 miles from city C. Which of the following could be the distance from A to C? Well, so we got A and B, it's 800 miles. City B is 1,500 miles from C. Well, so City B, I mean, City C could be here. City C could be here. City C could be here. We don't know in which direction with respect to A. So we know that B, C is not more than AB plus BC. That would be impossible, no matter what. We know that BC is not more than AB plus BC. Because if we go from A to B and then B to C, that's obviously more than going directly from B to C. We know that AC is likewise, it cannot be more than A to B and then B to C. because the straightest, uh, the, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. So 1,500 miles is one second. All right, so it can't be less than 800, so it's not 600, because no matter which way we go, No matter which way we go, it's not going to be less than 
800, no? Right. It can't be less than, it can't be 600 because 600 would be, back on a straight line. That would be, so A to B is 800, and then B would be 700 more. It can't be 600. It could be less than 800. But it cannot be 600 because if this were some kind of trickery where A were like a midpoint between B and C, then to double back and go through A to get to C, it's still 700 miles. So it can't be shorter than 700. That would be impossible, no matter which way we go. It would still be 1,500 here. It would still be more than 700 here. Right, so it's not A. Uh, could it be 1,000 miles? Yeah, why not? Could it be 1,200? Yeah. Could it be 1,500? Yeah, again, it, I mean, it could be here, 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 anywhere, as long as it's 1,500, a 1,500 mile radius from B. Uh, it, it could be any of these numbers, depending where on this circle it lands. It could indeed be E, if it's way over here, that could easily be 2,000, but it cannot be 2,500 because that would be more than, again, if we just drew a straight line, if this is 1,500, 1,500 plus 800 is 2,300. So it could be B, C, D, or E, but not A or F. It can't be more or less than uh, the distance uh, these two numbers added up or the difference between them. Just a little bit of trickery, just to confuse us. This is probably the most difficult question of the entire practice exam here. It requires us to remember Gauss, which is the sum. I mean, so we can just do, we can do 2n plus 1 is n over 2. Uh, n over 2 times 50 plus 1. All right, this is the sum of from 1 to 50, n plus n plus 1, right? n over 2, 50 plus 1 equals 50 times 51 over 2. And that's 25, 50 over 2, or 12, 75. That's C. Uh, Gauss looked at this by starting the, anyway, the story might be apocryphal, but by starting at the endpoints, you get 51. And then you got 2 and 49. And you sum those together, and you get 51. And then you got 3 and 48. And sum those together, and you get 51. And you got 4 and 47. You sum those together, and you get 51. And so on and so on and so on, until you see that you have sums of 51 times the total number of numbers, which is 50, and how many pairs are there in 50? Well, 25. 25 times the sum of each of those pairs, which is 51. Again, instead of starting, instead of starting with 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, look at the starting point and the end point. You get the sum, and then you work, way, work your way to the middle uh, until you get to 25, 26, which again sums to 51. Uh, 25 times 51 is 1275, and we can make short work of that one uh, either by thinking like the childhood Gauss or by just applying the formula. What's the largest prime factor of 5 factorial and 8 factorial? The largest prime factor of 5 factorial, 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, 20. 60, 120. And then we've got 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. And 
All right, so this is all 120 times 8 times 7 times 6. And so if this is 120 here, we'll figure out the factorial 5. We get 120. We're going to multiply that same fact 5 factorial times 8 times 7 times 6. We know that it has 7 as a factor. That's a prime factor, so B. Moving along. 21. Equilateral triangle is formed by joining the centers. Each pair of circles has one point in common. PQ equals 12. What's the shaded area? Well, that's going to be a sector, right? An area of R. Area R is equal to 6 squared because it's half the distance half that uh, join in the two centers. We share a single point in common, straight line between the two centers, so the radius is just half of that PQ, which is 12. The area is 36 pi. And the shaded area, because we know that that interior angle of the equilateral triangle is 60 degrees, we know that is uh, one-sixth of the area then for that sector divided by 6 and we get 6 pi. Uh, 6 pi is also known as 60 degrees A. A is the answer. Alright, almost done. Again, pretty embarrassing. I taught this, this is rules of exponents. I taught this to seventh graders. All right, so uh, working our way from the inside out, the outside in, I guess that's our big question here. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. And let's drop this down. Let's distribute first. X to the 21st over X to the 6th, parentheses first, and we get 21 minus 6 is X to the 15th. C. Done and done. What was the combined percentage of household expenses devoted to food and clothes in 2015? So we got 23. Food and clothes in 2015, 2009. Food, 29%. Clothes, 8%. 37%. Pretty simple, okay, 37%. 24, 4,800 was spent on clothes in 20, 000, 2008. How much was spent on food in 2008? 0.15 of whatever the total is, is 4,800. And 0.05 of whatever it is, is 1,600. So what does that give us there? So X is equal to D is the answer, 13,800. And oh, this is oh, this is just dividing. Sorry. Uh, how much is spent on food? All right. Uh, so we get 0 0.05 is dividing by three. That's just an easy way to use a common factor. Sixteen hundred dollars is five percent of the total budget. How much was spent on food? Food is 0 0.35. 0 0.35 is seven times. 0.05, so 7 times 1,600 is equal to 7,000 plus 4,200 is 11,200. D is the answer. And on to the last one. There's a little thinking involved. All right, there's a little bit of thinking. It's not the easiest test ever, but it's pretty darn easy. 
Suppose the total household budget was 6% larger in 2009 than 2007. What is the approximate percentage increase of money spent on housing from 2007 to 2009? All right, so we got point, point 0.18. Plus 0 0.48, 0 0.66, plus 0.38, 1.04. And then we're going to get uh, 0.38 times 1.06x minus 0.22x. is 8.2 roughly so D all right uh, gotta go that was really easy and um, I feel that it's almost a waste of time but the main idea is that you uh, need to study for your verbal test a lot more than your quantitative I think